Welcome everybody to our March uh, Coastal Commons Learning Network call. I'm Jess Coonan. Um, and we gather each month to talk about how to advance our own community science programming that's specific to shoreline monitoring of flooding and erosion. So we've been meeting since October and it's usually been a small group from the Northeast states, but today we welcome some new colleagues from the Northeast and across the US. Um, we're not gonna do introductions today just to make the most of our time with our guest speakers, but we're uh, really glad uh, you're all here to see your new faces. Um, this network is fairly informal with the goals of improving coordination and communication between Sea Grant programs, sharing best practices, lessons learned, and just increasing our capacity for these kinds of programs. So today we are excited to have our first guest speakers to offer some in-house expertise around community science. Kristen Grant is an Extension Associate with Maine Sea Grant and UMaine Cooperative Extension, located at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. Her work includes a range of activities to build the capacity of coastal communities to plan and adapt for their future. She led the Sea Grant visioning um, the Sea Grant Community Science Visioning Process and manages a successful long-term community science beach profile monitoring program in Southern Maine. And Allison Eberhardt, with the cool background when she's not displaying her video, is a Coastal Ecosystems Extension Specialist with New Hampshire Sea Grant and UNH Cooperative Extension. Her work involves community-based restoration and monitoring of coastal habitats. Allison was also involved in the Sea Grant Community Science Visioning Process, and she manages a citizen science program that trains volunteers to work on local coastal research projects. So thank you uh, so much for being here today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Really good yeah. to see everybody. And thanks so much for turning out, really. Great to be meeting with everybody. And um, I'm gonna actually start with a statement here. Um, so I wanna you know, do a land acknowledgement. So I live in and I'm talking to you today from Maine, which is the land of the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, Penobscot and Passamaquoddy who are known collectively as the Wabanaki, which means people of the Dawn land. And I want to acknowledge the Wabanaki um, stewardship of the land and their continued strength and resilience in protecting it. And I'm going to just give Allison a chance to um, introduce herself too. Hi everyone, I'm Allison and I'm just south of Kristen in what we now call New Hampshire, but um, I want to acknowledge that I am a settler on the homelands of the Abenaki, past and present and I acknowledge, honor, and I'm grateful for the land and for the people who have stewarded it through the generations. Good. Um, since we can't do official um, introductions to everybody else, how about if we just like weigh in on a few things? So everybody um, has um, probably gotten familiar with their reactions button. So um, let's have a reaction if you are ready to move on from COVID. Nice. All right, and how about a, um, a reaction if you're someone who is currently managing a um, community science program? All right, some good turnout there. Great, and how about if you're new to Community science, this is sort of your first rodeo. All right, nice. All right, thanks everybody. Appreciate that. Gives us sort of a sense of, you know, who we're talking to without spending the time on the all the introductions. So appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna get us started by just talking a little bit about um, community science in and across Sea Grant just for a minute before we dive into, you know, the real learning, you know, component that I know was central to the reason that this group has been gathering. So just to talk about um, the visioning process in community and science with, um, with Sea Grant, because um, community science had not been officially 
designated as you know, as a theme area as we're aware. So when the opportunity to put together those vision plans was um, made available to us in 2018, there was a group of us that, um, that gathered around that idea of community science being a place that, you know, we have lots of capacity in Sea Grant and, you know, as we discovered many, many programs to, to our credit. So in 2018, the group of um, representatives from about 14 of our Sea Grant programs and three partner organizations that included NOAA um, all met to begin developing that, um, that community science vision plan. And as a process, as a part of that process, we identified that at least at that time, there were minimally 85 existing um, Sea Grant community science programs. So it really, you know, blew our minds that there's that amount of capacity at Sea Grant. So the development of that vision plan led to the, um, the creation of the Sea Grant Community Science Network. And I'd very much like to connect this group with that network. So I'll let you know that there's a, um, there's a listserv that we have in place for the, um, the network you know, across the country. So if you're interested in, um, in that, you could add your, um, your email to the chat and we'll make sure you get added. Um, there uh, have also been um, presentations on the CS Network's um, work at um, several um, national conferences, and the network has met in conjunction with um, a couple of national meetings, including the um, Citizen Science Association and with Sea Grant Week. And, you know, as most groups did, we had our first virtual meeting in uh, 2020. And it, what was awesome about it was we ended up having 65 participants from across the country, which is more than we probably would have had if we had met um, in person. And we are also about to launch a, um, a website for the National Sea Grant CS network. So in a minute here, I'll put that link in the chat so you can all see the, um, the website that is just about to be made public. And we've also applied for a national um, CS um, liaison and are, you know, are waiting for the next steps on that. So lots and lots of um, progress made there. And we'd just like to foster those connections between this group and that larger um, group at the national level. So that's a little bit of introduction there, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Allison, and she'll get us started on the, um, the learning component of our time together. Thanks, Kristen. Lisa, you have your hand up. Did you want to say something? Okay. Um, I want to take a second just to give a little bit of background on the citizen science or community science, as we frequently call it in Sea Grant. Um, and I think what we term what we do is probably a worthwhile discussion for another day. But um, a little bit of background on the group that I manage called the Coastal Research Volunteers. And I do that in partnership with Wells Costello, who's joining us today. Um, he's my and Lisa's colleague in New Hampshire, at New Hampshire Sea Grant. I mention it because we work on about 10 to 12 community science projects a year. So they vary in scope, level of volunteer involvement, um, goals, methods. And so that, you know, so with each project we're, we're and we have a war story from this morning, just this past week as Wells and I are trying to figure out um, how to implement a project that is proving to be somewhat challenging. Um, I bring all this up, this variation in what we work on, because I always go back to the 10 principles and blurt out. So hopefully you had some time. And if you didn't, don't worry, you can, we're going to talk through some of them, or you can read it after the meeting or during the meeting. But the European Citizen Science Association, and we do have an analogous association here based out of the United States, the Citizen Science Association. Um, a few years ago, um, maybe five or six years ago, came up with these 10 principles. And in my mind, it's a really lovely one page succinct itemization of best practices. And so the way I look at these 10 principles, I don't think I have a single project that hits on all 10. 
Um, but depending on the goals of the project, um, I definitely try to hit as many as possible. And there are many projects that, you know, we're striving to hit additional principles that we haven't yet, or I just think this is, it, I almost use it as a, as a bit of a rubric. And as Chris and I were talking, some of these emerge to us as more important. You know, some of them are kind of foundational and in my mind should be a part of every citizen science project or community science project as a best practice. And then some are maybe a little bit harder to attain or, um, and I think that's ripe for discussion as well. So what we'd like to do today is to just workshop a couple of these that we've pulled out as really important and then hopefully foster some discussion around them. Um, and so to that end, I'm going to just start with the first one. And just in case folks haven't had a chance to get acquainted, I'll just read it very quickly. Um, citizen science projects actively involve citizens in scientific endeavor that generates new knowledge or understanding. Um, and there's, and citizens may act as contributors, collaborators, or as project leader and have a meaningful role in the project. So, um, that I think gets at how you structure your project, right? And what is the role of citizen science? And we have some nice um, models or ways of thinking about that that come out of the literature. Um, and one that I think is a worthwhile reference to keep in your, you know, wherever you keep your literature is the paper by Shirk et al. And we can throw that in the chat. Um, where Jennifer Shirk, who's currently the acting executive director of the Citizen Science Association, um, she goes through these different models of citizen science. And she has five, and I think we should chat about three different ones, um, the three in the middle. And that's contributory, collaborative, and co-creative. And so a contributed and a contributory project is one where your volunteers are typically simply providing data. So they show up, they implement some method, they hand over the data, and then they go home. Um, and so by way of example, Wells and I, this is not a shoreline monitoring project, but we have a project in partnership with New Hampshire Fish and Game where volunteers staff an eel monitoring site. Um, they staff it five days a week for about 10 to 12 weeks out of the year during the eel migration. They collect data, the data get handed over to Fish and Game. So their role is really as data collectors. So that would be an example of a contributory project. Um, a collaborative project is one where um, your volunteers are taking on a little bit, you know, it's kind of this, I don't wanna say hierarchy, because I, I don't like to put judgments on one that's better than the other. I think you want the one that best serves the project. But, you know, the stepwise, maybe the next level of involvement would be contributory. And I think, Kristen, you have some examples from Maine, Southern Maine Beach profiling. Sure, I'll pick it up for a second. Um, and I would also like to um, introduce Max Olson, who's the um, volunteer coordinator for the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program. And um, so I'll talk for a second about our program. And unlike um, Allison, who's working with, what is it, Allison, something on the order of 10 different um, volunteer monitoring programs that are part of the coastal research volunteers. It, we are a one trick pony in um, in Maine, at least for me. It's this is the um, the program that we work with. But it started in 1999. If there's you know any benefit to um, to that, we've managed to keep it running for coming on 22 years now. And it was actually started as a Maine Sea Grant um, research project. Um, so looking at how the possibility is there to, you know, start a project, you know, as at a research level, but then look at a transition to making it a long-term monitoring program. So that, um, it started in 1999 with um, geologists from the University of Maine and Maine Geological Survey. And, um, you know, so there was grad student, there were papers, there was all the stuff you would expect from a research um, project. 
And then because, you know, this effort had been made to build this monitoring program, um, there was an investment that Sea Grant made in, um, in of my time to continue the, um, the project since, you know, if we're talking about shoreline monitoring, you don't get much out of three years of data, but 22 years, you're starting to get what you're looking for. So, um, so in about 2002, the transition was made to this long-term program, and you know, over those years, we've had between 100 and 150 volunteers on something like 12 to 14 beaches, and in nine or 10 towns in um, in southern Maine. So, you know, sort of roughly between um, Portland south to the New Hampshire border. And also to our credit is in all, in all that time, the program has been um, adapted, picked up and turned into something slightly different to work in other places. So um, that's another one of the projects that Allison and her team uh, manages is the um, beach profiling program that um, is in New Hampshire, started with the main model and made it what was gonna work for them, but also um, same thing in California and um, amazingly in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And um, so the project started very much in this contributory um, phase. And, but over 22 years, the investment that the volunteers have made in some cases have been so extraordinary that you know, I think we are starting to see examples of it moving solidly into a, um, a collaborative um, phase where um, the, the background of uh, many of the volunteers, you know, has, you know, lent itself to being able to look really critically at the methods that we used, which is a method called the Emory um, Beach Profiling Method, which was, this, this, you know, created in like 1969. So probably there are opportunities in, you know, the 21st century to make some improvements to it. And um, so the um, several of the volunteers looked at the method and identified some places where it could be improved, made those proposals to a main geological survey, we tweaked the, um, the method and they actually presented on their findings to the beach profilers at the um, the main beaches conference in 2019. So that was a really nice example and very satisfying as you know somebody that's been involved with the program to see the um, the monitors you know stepping into readers leadership roles that way. So I think that probably um, does it for me. And Allison, did, did you want to go back to another one of your programs? Okay. Yeah. And so another recent project that Wells and I worked on. Um, and this was at the request, so this was in a response to an identified need from a local Department of Public Works who was had sea level rise modeling for the town, um, this is the town of Hampton, New Hampshire, um, was experiencing chronic sunny day flooding and was trying and is still trying to get a sense of how to resolve, you know, projections you know, tide gauge data and what people are actually seeing on the ground and what the drivers of variability are. And so, as you likely know, Lisa is part of a very strong program to collect um, king tide photos as a data source um, in New Hampshire. And then we piloted a project because frankly, we had no idea if it would work. Um, and so I do, I am a big fan of the pilot when you can, there's so many lessons learned in this work. Um, we piloted a project to engage local community members in getting out and delineating the flooding during a king, king tide. So going out, collecting waypoints um, and, and with the idea that if this method works and we had a critical mass of data and then you know collecting some other data like wind speed, wind direction, um, tide height, uh, we might be able to get a sense of what's driving some of the variability. So the actual like getting at what the drivers are is was beyond the scope of this pilot. But one of the things that we did do was adapt a method developed by Max Liberon, who runs a feminist and anti-colonial marine science laboratory at Memorial University in Newfoundland. And I'm gonna put the paper in the chat. Um, a method called community peer review. 
And what we did is rather than a model that we typically employ, where we collect the data, we synthesize the data and we report it back to the volunteers, we, Wells and I have really been toying with this idea of giving the data back to the volunteers and saying, what do you see? Like, does this make sense? Do you agree with this? Like, do you give us consent? Is your essentially methods for looking for consent by the people who are active participants in your data collection? And so I would say that was us taking a project and moving it beyond just contributory to more of a collaborative place where we were now saying, we, you know, your input is a critical part of this process, your input on the, the back end of the data analysis and interpretation. And I will say for the purposes of that project where you were taking these waypoints and, you know, putting them over in some, um, you know, putting them over aerials and, and with, you know, limited elevation data and you're trying to make sense of it, their observations and their interpretations were critical. And that was very eye-opening to us. So we've been trying to do that more and more in our projects and have done it with beach profiling as well. In fact, um, where we have our data reports and before we send them out to the world, we're putting them back in the hands of our volunteers and they're currently or about to conduct review of those for us. So, um, you know, just similar to Kristen, kind of maybe getting the project set up and then increasing involvement as you understand the project better and, and maybe you get more buy-in and, and connection from your volunteers. Um, the last the last in the kind of stepwise progression that Shirk, and all lay, Shirk at All lay out is co-created. And another like flag for discussion someday that I love to think about and talk about is whether that is best. Like that is often the, at the heart of community science, right? Like responding to the needs of the community and working in partnership with them to develop a project. It's not the people from the ivory tower coming and saying, this is how you should answer that question, you know, but saying, you know, what are, you know, and we all I think are, are well-versed in, in, in kind of the, the goals there. And so um, anyway, co-created is harder to come by and, and typically more time resource intensive with time and, and maybe money. And, and, and so I think those examples of true co-created projects are maybe a little bit harder to co come by, often come out of the environmental justice movement. We see um, a lot of co-created projects there. Locally, one I can think of that Wells and I actually aren't even involved with, but her colleague, um, Steve Jones, who's a microbiologist, he um, received a call from New Hampshire Surfrider Foundation and our state agency conducts water quality monitoring, um, I think like eight months out of the year and there's a four month gap and they were really interested in knowing the status of the water because they are active users of the coast. And so they reached out to Steve, they kind of worked with him. This is what our interest is. He helped them develop a method and now they're, they're collaborating. So I might, you know, you, you might see some, um, some uh, evidence for maybe a co-created project in there since, you know, they, they were an active member in identifying the need, developing, you know, how to address it and then, you know, um, disseminating and, and, and sharing data. So um, I guess any questions, and I, and I should say, you'll notice that you know, Kristen and I have a couple slides just as like prompts to think about, but we're really hoping to nurture discussion. And I think we're all maybe a little sick of just like sitting in front of PowerPoint slides. And so we purposely designed this to hopefully um, to spark discussion. Uh, I guess at this point, you know, we have a we have a question or a poll for you, but any questions about anything we've mentioned so far or comments? I do. Yeah, Pam. Um, Really interesting, thank you, because you could read the 10 principles, but I love hearing the examples, the real life examples. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious, so um, it seems like in both of, both of the cases, um, it kind of started in contributory, either with that group of people and or with the method, right? And then you went to collaborative. So, um, which I can very much see, especially for us, for some of the newbies, you know, but, or is that um, nowadays, you know, is that because the beach profiling was 20 years ago and technology and, and other kinds of things um, and different volunteers um, 
are now more aware of some of these things that you could just kind of jump into collaborative or any any thoughts on that? Should you really go one to two to three or co-created is probably different, but um, or can we just kind of say, okay, no, let's design this as collaborative. Let's design this as co-created um, or is it always useful to start with contributory? And I can jump in, but Allison, I'm sure you have lots to say on this. Um, my um, interpretation would be absolutely look at you know this as a um, as a model and start where it feels like the project lends itself to. There's n there's no necessity for it to evolve from one to the other. If co-created seems like the the best fit for you what it's trying to do is just help you sort of give you a framework for um for thinking about how you might develop that project but i i have no um reason to think about it as something that you might like move through the levels okay. start where it seems like it's most appropriate for what your objective is and allison yeah, I think that sounds right. Um, and I'll, I'll totally agree with Kristen and then maybe just build off it to say in addition to project goals, I think it has a lot to do with volunteer motivation and what's bringing them to the project. So, you know, we survey our volunteers every year to get a good sense of, of what is bringing them to our projects. And, you know, we often hear about the opportunity to to learn something new or have authentic experiences or access the resources of the university and kind of these, you know, personal growth, admirable things, but it's very different than when you're working with a, and so those I would say might be contributory type projects that those people are engaging in, maybe not, um, but when you're dealing with an affected community and we're dealing with this community that is, um, you know, experiencing, you know, over 70 days of sunny day flooding this past year and, you know, and people are in very flood prone areas. They have a very different motivation that they're bringing to data finding. And I think that's where you're going to start to shift to more of the co-created or the collaborative. And so, you know, it's this complex puzzle of many pieces, but to maybe oversimplify it, I would definitely include what is bringing the volunteers to the project as you know, helping to define your potential for their engagement. This is Juliana. I, I have a quick question. I love this idea of community peer review and and it's not something you've done yet. Is that correct? It's something you're going I, to do? No, we, I would say we've done it, but not to, I would say we've adapted it. You know, we haven't done it to the full extent that is laid out in that paper, but there have been two projects, Beach Profiling and um, the King Tide Flood Mapping, where before we did anything, we, you know, we maybe put, pulled the data together, packaged it and didn't interpret it all and gave it back to the volunteers for their input. And, and how did that go? You know, it's, um, it's interesting. It's uh, there, I think they're uncomfortable at first, at least was and Wells, I will invite you to chime in here too, because you've been a part of both of those. Um, at first, they're like, well, what do you mean? Like, we want to hear from you. And then we're like, you know, so there's almost this like transfer of power, I think that has to happen, where we are reinforcing no, you have valuable observations and data and we want them because they're a critical part of understanding the, these data. And once that happened and, and like everything, there's you know the early adopters who are like, okay, I'm gonna take a stab at this and say, well, like at this data point, like I remember being out there and yes, like that looks real. And you know, this person saying, I don't really know about that one. And you know, and then the process builds and people start to um, but it definitely in and of itself was a process where people, and I'm hoping, you know, some of our repeat volunteers who volunteer across projects will get more and more comfortable with this. But I would say it didn't happen instantaneously. It, it was, oh, they almost needed to be shepherded and, and reminded of and empowered, you know, and say, no, 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 you have valuable knowledge and, and we would like to have it as part of our um, data analysis if, you, if you'll share it with us. That, I, I love that transfer of power 
concept because it makes it such so much more of a two-way street. So anyway, thank you. That was great. For sure. Yeah. I think we could move on to the poll. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the if time. We, <laughs> we, you know, just wanted to have a conversation wherever this sort of leads. So we probably won't get to everything that we had planned to get to, but that's okay with us. So um, is Jessica, you, do you want to launch the poll? We could always invite you back. <laughs> And um, um, and um, Allison, you wanted to share the table too, right? To make it a little bit yeah. easier to answer the poll. So the yep. um, the poll question that you'll see here is, um, you know, based on the conversation that we've just had, what model of CS would you say most closely contributes, um, most closely describes your program if you have one? Contributory, collaborative co-created, not sure, not applicable. And for context, just, just in case, so you don't have to rely on your memory of our discussion, this is a table from that Shirk et al paper. I just grayed out the, the end points that they describe and, and have your definitions of the other three there for your reference. Great, all right. So, I mean, there's still coming in here, but um, oh. yeah, so. There are examples of, of um, co-created and collaborative out there in this group. Can you all see the poll? Ah. Don't okay. look at this. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not in our script, but you know, it, I'd love to hear from the, um, the people that have, this says there's two people that have co-created projects. That, Allison, that okay with you? I'd love to hear about those. Yeah, I, that one of them is me. Actually, I, I think that's all I've done. Actually, um, so I worked through the AGU text program, which is uh, supported just to do co-creation of, of science around issues communities are dealing with, and mine was nuisance flooding in the coastal zone. Um, and I think Allison, the last thing you said right before we did the poll was was right on. We value your knowledge, and and that's where that starts. That there is a a local and indigenous knowledge that these communities have and that they are realizing there's issues they're seeing in their communities that they're not really sure how to manage or, or respond to. And um, when you create that partnership, and I will say it's, it's, it's not that easy, but when you start to make that partnership and, and discuss with them, you know, how, what they think the problem is and what kind of endpoint are they looking to get to, um, you lay out the goals and objectives together and then create the research framework to help them understand the problem. And so, so that's where most of my work has been. And um, I would love to have a total one hour call on just all the issues that come up with co-creation because they are tremendous. And I, I don't think, Surfrider, I think with what you're doing with them, sounds like it's a, a kind of a, we really wanna understand what's going on for our own safety and health. Whereas some groups really want to understand to force policy change. And that becomes a challenge when you're trying to be the neutral science broker. Yeah, for sure. Tom, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And also, um, so text that he referenced is Thriving Earth Exchange, who um, is associated with the uh, AGU and they do, they have some really incredible materials um, that I refer to in my work. Um, and so I just threw up their website. It's one that's worth poking around for, for resources if you're interested. Yeah, and they, they always look for pro bono scientists for projects. So if you have an interest in becoming engaged, uh, there's plenty of opportunity through that program. So Tom, are both of those projects yours under co-created? No, I think somebody else threw one in. I think I was probably the other one. Right. Uh, um, which is pretty similar to Tom's project, I think, in a way. Um, I run flood watch, community flood watch in New York City. Um, and we do call it co-created, although sometimes we question that terminology. Um, but it did, it came up pretty organically. I think it started essentially as a Facebook group of a community board. And so from that, we needed a more, we realized that um, all of the flood reports that were coming up through social media needed a more uh, like 
rigorous way to collect and like standardize across uh, the city. And so that's how it came up. So it did, it started in small community groups and then we just sort of brought it all together into one program. So that's kind of why we call it co-creation, but it's, it's on the fence. And Katie, but, tell me, what was it called? Flood Watch? Was yeah, community, community flood, New York City Community Flood Watch. Can I ask what, what is it about it that is making you question whether it's wholeheartedly co-created? Um, a couple, well, just because it does become me asking people to submit flood reports a lot now. And, um, but I still do think it is co-created because we do always consult with the community about like, what, how would you like to submit flood reports? Like what's the easiest way and what's the most useful way to present flood data back to you? So, um, so I do, I, I do think it is co-creation. And then we also talk about it in terms of co-creating with the city agencies as well, um, who are involved in the project. So I'll say, yeah, I'll say it is co-creation. Thank you. Is, uh, is this working for everybody if we just, if we dig in on this a little bit rather than just like forcing ourselves to surge ahead in our content? As I'd really like to hear about this one was listed as collaborative. I'd really like to hear about that one too. The, somebody identified their project as collaborative? I think that was me, um, but I'll let Pam speak because maybe I'm just wrong. I'm new to this whole piece. And Pam disagrees, it's not collaborative. <laughs> I'm out. No, I didn't say anything. No. <laughs> So Kathy and Pam, you're trying to decide if in fact a project is collaborative, is that? Oh, is that Kathy? I thought that was Luann. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah I was thinking oh, my Kathy. was collaborative, um, but I think I'm misunderstanding because like I said, I'm new to this whole process in supporting Pam. <laughs> so um, I think, Kathy, good point. So it is collaborative in, in some ways because we reached out and we have different, and it's a there's um, our one of the big NGOs, the biggest NGO in the state, plus um, our Coastal Council is involved with it. So, which has made it a really nice collaboration because the different groups use it for different reasons and use it for different outreach purposes. So, um, and I think that that's another success factor that we would say at least, this is for doing my coast, is that we need different partners to be able to help sustain it and to bring different, um, you know, different assets to it, but um, and we're trying to get groups of people and neighborhoods to be be kind of more of what you were talking about, <clears throat> Allison, about you know getting them involved because it's it's for their use. So um, we're collaborating collaborating as a partnership and trying to enhance that collaboration and incorporate the communities at the same time, you know. For them to be co co creating their this next part. So, yeah, and I think my perspective on these bins are really that they're for our own use and conception of our program and design and where it is and where you want it to go. And so, I, I just want to stress, at least from my mind, there's no one is better than the other. I think it's the one that's best for a given objective. Right. Um, so at least that's my take. Really good point. Thanks so for pointing that out though, Kathy. Yes, Kathy's new to our group. She's she's working with our team here. Great. So we're, you know, that was an awesome conversation. Thank you everybody for, you know, sharing all of your experiences, really, really good to learn from everybody. Um, yeah, Allison, still have time to move on to um, science outcomes and, and benefits? And yeah, and I'm probably not going to get to our we, last point here, but. And I think if we can only hit on two of these, these two would be my top. So, um, okay, so is this, this is me, right? Um, Number two, citizen science projects have a genuine science outcome. And this one it loops in another one further down. Um, oh, which is number three. So actually I would say this is two and three. Um, both the professional scientists and the citizen scientists benefit from taking part. And I'm gonna share my screen again to help 
um, to help conceptualize at least my thinking on this. And this is a um, conceptual model that uh, Michelle Prisby at Virginia Tech Extension um, created. And everyone can see it okay. Um, so when Wells and I are working with a community or a researcher or a natural resource manager to define, define a project, one of the first things we share, and it's actually in the mission statement of the Coastal Research Volunteer Program, is this idea of dual objectives and dual objectives that are held up equally. So there's your research or your management objective. Okay, so what are you going to do with the data? And then in Michelle's model, it says educational objectives. And I might change that to say, whatever it, it your volunteer is getting whatever it is they came to get out of out of their involvement, right? So you're fulfilling objectives in terms of the data and the use of the data. And you're fulfilling, you know, your whatever the you know, you're providing a rich experience for the volunteer and whether that be education or social interaction with like-minded with people with similar interests or whatever. Um, and the way that Michelle does this in the teeter-totter, it, it, like I learned of this, you know, a decade ago and it has just, it was sticky in my brain, which is why I wanted to share it. Um, you know, if you have strictly research objectives and, and that is the driving force, then um, you you know then you're and actually I feel like I'm looking at the teeter totter wrong, <laughs> but in my mind that's free labor right like what are your volunteers getting out of it? It's just a research project. Like in my, it, honestly, if that's the goals, then I would suggest get a grad student, hire an intern, get an hourly person. Like what do you need volunteers? There needs to be a real reason, you know, either you're increasing your spatial sampling or your temporal sampling, or you need, you know, you need the knowledge that these people bring, or there needs to be a reason to have volunteers or else it's just a research project with, um, and then similarly, if you don't have clearly outlined research objectives and a clear, what I like to start with is like, what, how will these data be used? Like any good research project, right? Like, it helps define your methods and the data you collect. Like, what is the goal of the project? And I would say, and you know, Wells and I have turned a couple of projects down and said, oh, I don't think you need us, or I'm not clear what you're doing with these data. And you know, and obviously our roles and extension will workshop it with them. But there have been times where we're just like, mm, we're, you know, uh, we're not putting our stamp of approval on this one, and so we've turned projects down. Um, because then, you know, if it's, it, it might just be an outreach project and, and those have value, no question, or an educational project, but I would not put them under the label of citizen science or community science. So I don't know if this visual works for you, but like I said, it's, it's always stuck in my head of that just, you know, the underlying idea that we have two equally important goals um, that we want our project to meet. Okay. Any any reaction? I was just gonna say I was with you, Alice, and I had the teeter totter wrong too. I was looking at it and I was like, wait a minute, but I got it now. It was perfect. It took me a while to figure it was the weight. Yeah, the um, weight. <laughs> um, I, I will just say that when you look through the social science literature, especially with BIJ communities, um, that balance is really important because some communities feel like they're continuously used to collect data for some research project and never see any benefits from it. And so in those kind of communities, that's, it absolutely has to be an equal playing field. That's such a good point. And I think we have uh, the community I mentioned before in, in Hampton is considered a frontline community for chronic flooding. And I think we're, many of us are aware of, of just that, of fatigue and their return on investment and wanting to be very sparing in our requests because we know that not only are they suffering from the conditions under which they live, but from all of our constant, you know, demands on them and getting in there and wanting more and more data. So I think that's a point really, really well taken. So maybe we can shift over to, you know, some examples 
here. So, uh, so I'll pick it up with, um, you know, getting back to our application to the beach profiling program in Maine, where because we have 22 years of data behind us, the opportunity for those science outcomes to lead to management outcomes have been um, really um, of a huge benefit to our communities. So, um, so I'll talk about those just for, um, just for a minute. And the fact that um, the, in our case, the value of the program continues to increase the longer we can sustain it since you know, the, um, the longevity of this data set is really what is enabling those science outcomes to turn into management outcomes. So there's, and I'll talk about these in sort of like general categories of the way that the data has been used because there's lots of different specific examples. But um, so obviously we're looking at, um, you know, erosion rates. So I'm looking at the acceleration um, in certain time periods. Um, so for, you know, looking at um, new um, erosion mitigation opportunities, um, looking at design of dune restoration and path improvements, uh, replacement of um, seawall options, evaluation of um, beach nourishment efforts and um, colonization of dune grass, looking at beach nourishment in, um, in relation to dredging projects, and um, looking at permit applications for Natural Resource Protection Act. Oh, you won't even cover all of these, but um, in, in particular, one that's been um, interesting is it's, this is one of the few data sources that um, has been used by Army Corps of Engineers in order to, um, to monitor um, beaches in relation to, um, to dredging projects. So that's been um, really helpful for our, you know, for communities to be able to see the benefits. Um, and, um, and recently it's actually also been used to, uh, for a, the, the most sort of comprehensive um, seawall redesign um, in the state um, was guided by the, um, the beach profiling data. So, so at this point, the, the benefits to the communities where these, um, the program is taking place have become really clear to the point that the main reason that the project has been able to sustain itself all these years is that in starting, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago or something, um, we started going to the, um, the municipalities themselves to ask for them to fund the program. So that, that, you know, because the continuation of monitoring programs is extremely difficult trying to find, you know, funders for um, something that you're potentially going to keep doing for decades is a challenge. So, um, so looking at this case, in this case, who are the um, direct beneficiaries of the data and how could we turn that into, you know, what is not a lot of money, but enough money to, um, to sustain the program because it, um, it funds essentially uh, Max's time. My, my time is provided as match, but all of that has, um, has put us in a position to be able to have a program that's 22 years old and hopefully will continue for much longer than that. So I'll turn it back to um, Allison to talk to a couple, a couple of other examples. Yeah, and don't be intimidated by all Kristen's amazing outcomes because that's what you get from a very well-run program for two decades, right? So this is like what we're all aspiring to. I at least tell myself that because our beach profiling program is in its fifth year and we do not have those outcomes, but we are getting there. Um, and so I just want to share a little bit about our profiling program because it was very much built on the structure, we took main structure and transferred it to New Hampshire and made some tweaks to work for, for us and our, our communities and our coastline. Um, and we had originally intended to fund it the way Maine funds theirs. We were gonna ask our coastal communities to, um, to buy in to the program. And that doesn't work in New Hampshire because unlike to our north in, in Maine and unlike to our south, particularly the Plum Island area and Salisbury, they value sand and they know the, re the, the role that sand plays in storm buffering capacity. 
And apparently in New Hampshire, <laughs> we, our communities don't necessarily prioritize that. Um, we have a tax structure that is quite interesting and drives a lot of decision making and, and where funding goes, including most of our beaches are state owned. Our state parks do not have a budget line in the state budget. They're purely funded by entrance fees. So they don't feel like they have money to spare. And again, getting back to the whole sand issue, I don't think that they, that at the out, when we first started this project, I don't think our stakeholders, namely our coastal municipalities and our state parks program valued the work. They're, they're like, what are we, what do we want this data for? Like we, we rake our algae, we contour our beaches so we can fit more blankets on it. Done. Like, I don't understand why we need these data. So for us, I would say some of our biggest outcomes in the last few years is really working with municipal boards and our state parks partners to understand the threat that our beaches are under and sharing with them sea level rise and storm surge protections, sharing with them the role that beaches and dunes play. We have a very hardened shoreline, artificially hardened shoreline in most cases in New Hampshire. Um, and showing them what the data um, can tell them and help how it can help guide decision making. So that is where we're at. We did have, I think, what I hope to be a big breakthrough. I was invited to share our data. The Hampton Beach Area Commission is developing the hazard mitigation chapter of their master plan. And I spoke and, and we have an estuary that's dredged every five to seven years. And they bring the dredge material, which is like a really lovely great, um, sand that's clean and perfect for nourishment projects. And they just put it right outside the mouth of the estuary, which is cheapest. And our data show that is not what needs it. In fact, that is the place where it's quickly just going to be like longshore currents going to take it away. And um, you're not really going to get much return on your investment as opposed to one of the beaches to the north that is severely in peril. Um, it's where there are hundreds of thousands of dollars regularly damaging the infrastructure that's there. And that beach would very much benefit. And so we shared our volunteer collected data, just this was a month or so ago. And a conversation started about, you know, now the town needs to look out five to seven years and figure out how to raise the additional funds to get the different dredge material and pay above what Army Corps pays to move the sand up. But that conversation is starting. And so again, we don't <laughs> have this amazing list, but you know, we're a younger program and our conditions are such that we're dealing with a little bit more of a hostile environment. And so, um, but anyway, all of that is to say, we're really starting to see a little bit of a, a change in how people are valuing the data, even just being invited to share the data at this meeting to help guide decision-making. That in and of itself, I think was an outcome and now hopefully leads to something more. So we have five minutes left here and we, you know, as I said, we're not going to get to everything we had planned to do here. We have this, this whole engagement activity for all of you. So, so Pam, maybe we could talk about, you know, another time to come back and pick this conversation up. But, um, but I prompted Max earlier if, because we just finished a, a really comprehensive survey with our volunteers. So I was hoping that Max could talk us talk to us for a minute about some of the uh, messages that we can take from that survey about what the, um, the volunteers see as the benefit to them of participating in the program. So take it away, Max. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, it's kind of, in a lot of ways, parallel what Allison had been saying with her volunteers. I kind of came into the volunteer coordinator position, you know, with the intention of upholding the scientific value of what we're collecting, but at the same time, trying to raise as much as I could the value and the benefits that are being received by the volunteers themselves. Um, so kind of our survey, we, at the moment, we got about a 70% response rate is open for a few more days. So hopefully you get it kicked up a little bit more. Um, but when it comes down to it, I kind of took motivations as my orientation towards the benefits for those volunteers. Um, and a bunch of them, I think it, we ended up narrowing it down to 11 categories. Kristen reined me in a little bit. I was trying to go gung-ho with it. Um, but so topics like, you know, environmental concern as motivator, um, wanting to give back to your community, you know, increasing your own knowledge. So a lot of these intrinsic values 
also with some broader societal and environmental impacts as motivators. Um, and time and time again, what we're, well, what, what that data is initially indicating is that those environmental concerns are big pushes for wanting to, to mo or to wanting to volunteer and motivating people to volunteer, um, but also learning new skills. The one that kind of wasn't as important was um, improving, increasing your capacity for a future career. A lot of our uh, volunteers are baby boomers, so we uh, post career, but there are some younger folks that was very important too. Um, and later on in the survey, I asked a question about whether they agree or disagree those motivations for volunteering their time was being met. And overwhelmingly, it was indicating that yes, they are getting those motivations met. Um, it was a pretty simple question, but it was uh, yeah, kind of with the limited space, the best we could do at the time. So I'll, since there's a couple minutes left, I'll kind of hand it back over to you folks. Great, thanks, Max. And I just want to you know, note 70% return rate. Woohoo, that was awesome. So thrilled. And um, yeah, so we'll be looking at, you know, how we can, you know, turn some of what they told us into, you know, actionable items for the for the program. And at least in terms of our content, I'm sure that's all we're going to get to here. So should we turn it back to, to Pam and Jessica for a wrap up?